September 17, 2020. Monthly school board meeting. Would you pray with us? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We ask your blessing down upon uh, all of our school kids. And Lord, as we come back to school Monday, we pray that you'll just put your hand down and don't let anybody be sick. Keep everybody safe. If we want all of our kids to be uh, lifelong learners, to be well educated, so they'll be prepared for uh, going to work and have a successful life. We pray for we. You know, God direct us, we'll be good stewards of everything we're in charge of tonight. Let us make uh, good decisions. We pray a, a blessing down on each and every one that's here tonight and all over, all over county. And when we pray for all those that's uh, battling these storms from the hurricanes. And we give you praise for all that you do. And then uh, Jesus, we pray. Everybody say it. Amen. 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 Ohio County Schools, schools provide students with the skills, knowledge, and support to achieve excellence and become lifelong learners. <laughs> All right, you all have your agendas in front of you. We have added a number 13. Purchase of a special needs bus. And is there anything you'd like to pull off to discuss or something else you would like to add at this time? If not, any motion to approve the agenda? I'll make like the motion. I'll second the motion. Got a motion and a second. Any more <coughs> comments? Or any comments? All in favor? Motion carried. All right, we don't have no presentation, no recognition. No, sir. Nobody in the state. Board members have anything? All's well on the western front. Uh, yes, sir, I do, as usual. Uh, a few things I'd like to just share. Um, as you're aware and as you just prayed about, thank you for doing so, Mr. Evans. Uh, we will be in school with our hybrid schedule starting on Monday, the 21st. I had talked with each of you either on the phone or via text and make sure I got your blessing before we announce that. But uh, we have announced that and are moving forward. That way we will have two weeks of in-person instruction before we take off for fall break. Uh, looking at the hybrid schedule, as I've told you all on the phone, most of our numbers are very, very manageable. When you look at the elementary level, a common number that you see is eight. Yeah. Yeah, I'll favor them every time yesterday when I did the class in Terrible White that kindergarten had the highest numbers at like 10 and 11 yep. or 12 or something like that. At Avery Dam, you're correct. Their highest was kindergarten and you have 10 and 11 in each room uh, so rarely do you have those numbers there are a few of them but it's not very many the, about the biggest number you see at the elementary level is 11 most numbers are single digits now when you get to middle school that changes a little bit but again you see numbers from 9 to 12 typically 12 is about as high as you're going to see there might be one or two exceptions but most of the time 12 is a common number when you get to high school you see numbers more like 11 to 13. Every now and then there's a class that may have 14 in it or so, but most of the time, and when I say most of the time, what I did was look at the core classes. I looked at English to see the AB breakdown, and then pretty much that freshman class that's massive, when you look at those freshman numbers, most of the time you saw 13, every now and then a 14 kids in the classroom. So the numbers are manageable. So keep in mind with hybrid, we're splitting it in half, but you're splitting in half those that are choosing to come to school. Mm -hmm. We already have that certain percentage, that 15 to 20% that are choosing to do online. So at the high school that are going virtual, you have close to 300 students that are choosing to stay on virtual. That number is a little bit less. Uh, when I was at visiting with the high school today, they showed me that since we've made the decision to go to school in person, there's been about 12 students move to virtual but there's been 25 to 30 leave virtual to say that they're coming to school starting next week so more have come back to school than we have lost so I, I, obviously there i'm sure there are some that are concerned i would be lying if i tell you i'm not a little bit concerned about everybody coming back together but as a whole everyone is excited teachers are ready to have kids back in the building they want to see their faces again. They want to be working with them. I know kids are excited 
to be coming back to school. As strange as that sounds, you know, usually kids love summer vacation, but summer vacation has lasted six months this year, and they're ready to come back to school. Uh, the ones that I've been seeing, I like to stop and ask them questions, and they're like, I want to go back to school. This remote thing is okay, but I, I'd rather be back in school and actually seeing my teacher and seeing some of my friends. Uh, yeah, we will have to be wearing these masks, uh, at least to start the process. That's what we'll be utilizing. Hopefully that will loosen up as time goes on. But even in talking to, the, to kids, and especially my own two sons, they're like, Dad, we'll gladly wear that mask as long as we're back in school. We, mm -hmm. just, we just want to be back. That this remote thing's going okay, but it's not the same. We, we learn better hearing directly from our teachers in the classroom. So I'm excited to get back starting on Monday. Obviously, we updated our, if you saw that on the website or the Facebook page, we updated our reopening plan, made some changes again, notified everyone about the masks, uh, reviewed some of the processes and how our plan was approved by the health department. We'll be disinfecting and cleaning each and every night and we'll be cleaning throughout the day when possible. You know, we'll be cleaning the restrooms regularly. We will be at the middle school and high school during class exchanges. We will be cleaning the desks before the next group arrives. That way, if someone was to be sick, whatever the case sickness may be, that desk will be cleaned before the next student comes in and, and has, a, has, their, has their place at that desk. And they're gonna do the one way? Down the hall. As best we can at the schools, we're going to eliminate traffic flow and try to get everybody going the same direction. Now, some of our schools, that's not going to be possible because they only have one hallway, but we're going to do the best we can there. Uh, lunch, if you've been in any of the schools, and you probably haven't right now since things are different, but uh, lunch rooms, like for the high school, all their lunchroom tables are pushed to the side, and we call them the ACT tables, but they're just long narrow tables that they would usually sit out when we do testing each year that's what they have in the cafeteria they're all facing the same direction and those tables are long enough you can set a kid on each end and they're right around six feet apart and then those tables are spread out so we can get around 110 to 120 kids in the cafeteria at once we will because we may have 140 each lunch period there might be 20 or 30, 20 to 30 students have to go to the gym and we've pushed in one section of the bleachers and we will set up those tables and one classroom may have to go eat in the gym. They'll go through the lunch line and then take their food up there to make sure we have plenty of room. Middle school has actually put desks. They have desks all in their cafeteria all facing the same direction because that's the re recommendation, the requirement, face the same direction, that way they're not facing one another. Uh, Beaverdown Elementary, I know Ms. Titchener sent me a picture today of her gym, her uh, cafeteria, and they've done the same thing. They have desks where they placed and they're all facing a certain wall. So everybody will come and sit at a desk. The desks are, desk are six feet apart. Channel 14 News uh, came by, called me yesterday. They went to Beaverdam today and, and interviewed the principal. And Monday morning, they'll be there from a distance outside getting some footage to do a little story, a little feature on Ohio County Schools. And that was Channel 14. Um, new metric. That's the, the hottest topic, if you will, if you've uh, seen the latest on what was released, I guess it was Monday. So that's those handouts that I'd passed out to you just so that you could get a, a glimpse of what it may look like. Each and every day, I signed up for it actually this afternoon. Each and every day, every school is going to be required to report to the Kentucky Department of Health, also KDE, what our numbers were for that day. And it's, it's basically four questions. Did you have any students that, were, that you were notified as being positive with COVID? And if so, how many? So you put zero to whatever that number may be. Same question for staff. And then, do you know of anyone in your building that's been quarantined? How many students? How many staff? That will have to be reported each day. So I'm going to ask the school, they're going to have to know that information. But instead of them reporting it, I'm going to have them send that information here and we're going to report it each day on behalf of all of our schools. Mm -hmm. That way we 100% know what has occurred. Right now that's going to be me that they're going to have them send that to and I'll report on that spreadsheet each and every day. But I will have a backup here. That way if I'm out of pocket, someone else will log in. Uh, perhaps Mr. Hoover, that way he can put in those numbers if I'm not here. That way, that way it's always done. 
Same way if the health department, when they're notified of someone testing positive or quarantining, they're contacting me. Uh, they already have. Right now, I will tell you, obviously not giving any uh, other identification other than right now, we do have three students in Ohio County Schools that have tested positive. One student is elementary at Beaverdam. They are virtual, so they won't be returning. There's one student at middle and one at high that do plan on attending, but because they tested positive earlier this week, they're not going to be attending until the health department clears them to attend. So I have those names and I've shared those with the administration. Uh, one of the cases, the principal's already talked to the family and the family knows when their kid can be cleared, when they get to come to school, they won't be here that first week of school. That's going to happen. Mm -hmm. The schools that are in session, Warren County has been in session for several weeks now. Yeah. They have been a county that's been in red the whole entire time. They have cases, but it's been very manageable. It's been single digits at each school. I don't think even in their district that they never really had a day where they've had double digits. It's just been a few here or there at a school. It's been things that they've been able to maintain and, and not cause a big hurdle. It's been very few staff and very few students. But I do want you to be aware it's going to happen. So, and, and that's the message I'm trying to tell all of our staff when I'm at the schools because some of our teachers are nervous. Folks, listen, I guarantee you sometime in the next month or so, somebody in your building is going to be positive, whether it be a student or a teacher or some other staff, it's going to happen. But as long as we still have substitutes and as long as we can quarantine and keep functioning, my goal is to remain on a hybrid schedule as long as we can physically continue serving our students safely. If we ever get to that point where we can't, then we'll back up and, and do something different. And that leads me to this docu these documents. The first one is just an example of once we report it, they said this is what it will look like. There will be a, a page that will be basically for Ohio County Schools, and it'll, mm -hmm. it'll, give about, it'll tell how many students have tested positive, how many staff, and they'll provide a little graph to show you a trend line. Are we going up? Are we staying the same, going down, whatever the case may be. So you, we'll get a report that will be shared out weekly on the state page that will be basically just for Ohio County and we will put that actually even on our website that way any parent wants to look on a weekly basis they'll be able to look on our front page and see what's going on. You may have seen these these slides or these pictures if you're looking at that uh, Kentucky Department of Public Health page and that's the two data points they've asked us to look at every Thursday evening. Every Thursday night what they have recommended is that superintendents log in Look at the system and you look for two things. You look to see the positivity rate, and that's for the state. And as long as that's below 6.0, the state basically says local board decision. Do what you feel like you need to do. Mm -hmm. If it ever gets above 6, he said that's when they might try to take some type of action because the whole state's in a area they don't want them to be in. Mm -hmm. And if you've looked all summer long, it's been very rare, if ever, that we've been over 6.0. So they picked a number that unless something really bad happens with outbreaks, the state shouldn't be back at 6.0. I think today uh, it may have been 3 point something. It actually wasn't even 4. So second diagram will be the picture of the overall state that shows the counties. The counties will be color-coded into red, orange, yellow, or green. And that has to do with how many cases you have per 100,000 people. Now there was a second, another document that went with that and it broke down those colors and it tells about it on one side and then there's a chart. It's a little bit hard to read. I struggled trying to read it all today with the color schemes. But on the back of it, those color schemes, it tells you if you're green, uh, that's when you're on track. And matter of fact, if you were green, in theory, you could go back to normal. Uh, it's hard to get green. I will say when you look at the map, very few counties have been green. Yeah, it's, it's very, very few because if you have more than one case per 100,000, you're not green. So most of the time you're going to be yellow or orange. So if you're yellow or orange, their rule of thumb is then we recommend you doing like your hybrid schedule. And they recommend you moving forward, that you can move forward with athletics and things of that nature too. If you're ever red, now here's what I want to remind you. This is a recommendation. 
just like we've had other recommendations and we are going back one week earlier so we're not following that recommendation to a T we followed it most of the time but their recommendation is that if you're in red that you automatically go to remote and you suspend all sports activities now here's what I'm going to ask you tonight and I know it really wasn't on the agenda to vote but I'm going to ask your blessing or your guidance that's what they have proposed and there was a district that I was talking to today in my superintendent's regional meeting that said they're going to recommend to their board that they follow this to a T. Most everybody else did not agree with that, and I, nor do I. Here's what I would like to have your blessing on. I will certainly always look at this on Thursday night to help me decide what to do for the next week, but I don't want to rely on just this alone. And here's why. Give me an example. Uh, Muhlenberg County. Now, let me give you the best example. Union County. Mm -hmm. Union County, if you look today on that state map, yeah. if you look at today's, they're at 44 point something. The highest in the entire state, Union County. Talked to their, their superintendent. She was on our uh, Zoom or Google Meet there today. They've been in school for several days now. And they have yet to have one positive case with staff or students, but yet their county is the highest positivity rate, if you will, in the state of Kentucky. They haven't canceled anything, nor are they going to, because it hasn't had any impact on the schools yet. There's other reasons why it's going on. Look at Grayson County. Grayson County has been yellow and orange, like us. They were red the last two days until this afternoon. Well, one of their factories, they brought in a testing crew and they tested and they found a bunch of positives at that factory. Well, that caused their numbers for two days to change and they were in red. And everybody was like, oh, do we even play them in sports or not? They're red. Well, they went back to orange this afternoon when they released the numbers around 4 o'clock. Um, so they're actually here going to be playing volleyball in a few minutes out at uh, high school. Well, their soccer team was in quarantine. Yes. Um, so... I'm not saying this isn't important, this isn't worth looking at, I just don't feel like this alone should be our guide or a roadmap. If you tell me to follow it, then that's exactly what I'll follow, but I would rather have your permission. How about you come up with a number of students or staff? Instead of having the whole county, so I, we need county to go by what the, what the I would rather have the, staff is. the flexibility mm -hmm. to make an informed decision as yeah. to whether or not we should continue with athletics or sports. Absolutely. If we have problems at our schools, then we'll make adjustments. But as long as it's manageable and we can function. Yeah, the rest of the county will matter. It's our students. And yeah, staff. you could have something else. It could be a nursing home, it could be a, a factory that causes your numbers in the county to spike. But to me, it doesn't necessarily reflect or mean that you can't potentially have school. I mean, that's been our spikes in this county, nursing homes and factory. Yeah. Well, I'm going to assume then, hearing you speak and seeing your head gestures, that you're not going to expect me to follow this to a T, that I'm going to have some flexibility to make some judgment calls. Yep. Right. All right, very good. That's Can what I, I need to do. ask you about testing? Do you know, is the health department testing or just the medical? Both. Oh. You, you can get it at any place. Hospital, clinics, um, health department. My daughter's father-in-law went and had, was tested, and they told him to be five to seven days. Oh, really? Yeah, and that was out at the clinic. So, so I don't know. Yeah. Really? Yes. That's what they told him. Wow. I thought it was uh, like three to four. Yeah. Was the Kathy got tested window. Friday, and they told her, called her Sunday afternoon, and told her it was negative. Be so Monday. normally it is three to four. Us days. Yeah. Usually it's been two to three days. Well, yeah. But now they're fixing to get the rapid. Our hospital's fixing to get the rapid. Uh, rapid, rapid test. test. Mm -hmm. Good. Like, 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 like fifteen minutes. Is that like fifteen minutes? Right now they're using it for their Not staff sure. um, and for some pre surgeries, mm -hmm. but they're fixing. We don't know how many they're going to get, but they're going to get some. So and, that's, that's, that's a good thing. Longer. And I've talked to the health department more in the last two or three weeks than I have in my entire career. Uh, but I've gotten to know some of them pretty well. 
And obviously, they're, they're going to be a guide through us in this process too. Anytime somebody's reported, it's supposed to run through them. They, they will determine quarantine periods. We will do the contact tracing. So if a student tests positive, I will contact that school, inform them, have them do the contact tracing. And if there's any names that were identified as being exposed, I will then give them to the health department and then they will take it from there as far as contacting that family and saying they can't be back at school until 10 days or whatever that time frame may be. Uh, like I said, it's going to happen, but just don't panic when it happens. It, it's going to be okay. It's going to be something that we can manage. And, and if, if it's something ever does get out of hand, then we'll make adjustments. And if we have to go remote for a couple of weeks to let things calm down, we will certainly do that if it's required. Uh, that concludes my report. Just wanted to give you an update. All right. Appreciate that. All right. You have your consent agenda in front of you. I need a motion to approve the consent. I'll make a motion. I'll second the motion. Any comments on the consent? Up. All in favor? Motion carried. You have the personnel report for your review. Carried report.
Yeah, as you know, that project has uh, been completed for a while. But you know how the wheels sometimes off, well not sometimes, the wheels do turn slow when it comes to facilities at KDE. BG4 is what's required to close out a project. So that's that final document to wrap that project up. In my recommendation to approve the BG4. All right, I need a motion to approve the BG4. I'll make that motion. All right, we have a motion. Second. Have a second. All in favor? Motion carried. We will have anything, I'm sorry. Anything how that in that project was there anything left? I'm not for sure. Was there any care content? I'm sure there was some. Yes. Yeah, there was some. I don't remember how much it was. But, um, we'll, you know, when we identify for sure, when we get approval of the four, we have to do five after that, mm -hmm. and the five will identify the, that residual amount, and then we'll can utilize that for another future project. Well, we got more <laughs> The BG process, as y'all have heard me say before, is sometimes a little bit frustrating. There's BGs one through five, and it just sometimes it's overkill. It could be a little more streamlined, but it is what it is. Yeah, three would be plenty, wouldn't it? It'd be more than enough. <laughs> All right. Uh, FY twenty one working budget. Salary benefits total that makes up 
the 64% and the contingency of 23%. Then we just look into the salary and benefits segment and to see what the largest breakdown is on that. You can see the classified makes up 17%. The classified is the large uh, blue section, which is 43%. And then our on behalf payments, as you recall, I think it was 9.3 million. So that makes up 30%. The others that are, of course, the um, you know such other smaller areas of uh, substitutes and um, benefits like KTRS and, and county retirement as well. Then this page just gives you a listing of uh, the larger fund two or special revenue grants, and the top section shows um, a lot of the larger local grants that we have. Uh, the USF reimbursements, that's where the state reimburses us for what we apply for on our E-rate application for technology related expenses. And uh, reading recovery we get from the University of Kentucky. And then uh, the Fordsville Educational Program, uh, about $110,000. So about $317,000 in local grants. And then the state grants make up about $1.6 million. You see the extended school services, uh, that's part of the flex focus funds that the state allows us to kind of move and shift those dollars around. So we, uh, we transfer those, uh, that amount over to our safe schools so that we can fund the resource officers and, um, and focus on the safety in our schools. And then our preschool area, you may recall last year we were cut about $100,000. And so the general fund basically had to pick up that shortfall. Well, we got about 40000 of that that came back this year. Good. So that was certainly good news. That's probably the largest change that we had in, in the state funding. Last year it was about 1.5, little over 1.5 million in the state. And federal is really uh, an, uh, the section that, that we had a lot of increase this year. They are up, just the state, about $261,000, and that does not count our CARES Act money. So predominantly the Title I went up the most. Uh, we gained about almost $200,000 there. Migrant went up $40,000. IDEA went up $20,000. And Teacher Quality went up $14,000. Perkins actually went down. That's the uh, Carl Perkins the vocational funds. That actually went down about $10,000. But overall, we went up quite a bit. If you look at the whole fund uh, in aggregate, it increased to a little over $300,000. And just to recap, the, the reason you don't see the CARES Act money here, it is the, that is a federal grant. The reason you don't see it here is because the state, because that was allocated in the FY20 year, it is. It really kind of misses the budget, if you will, yeah. because if we didn't have it when we presented the, the FY20 grant or budget to you, but it's actually categorized in the previous year. But we're still obviously spending it predominantly in this school year. But it's just technically not a part of this working budget. But it's a little over a million dollars for the CARES Act. And this just shows a breakdown of fund two and looking at it from a different perspective, just looking at the expenditures by object codes, what we call those, um, looking at salary totals and benefit totals, as you would expect. Salary benefits makes up the largest part of our expenditures. Supplies uh, obviously captures, you know, all instructional supplies and uh, property includes all of our technology equipment, computers. Chromebooks and so forth. So all that there again, 4.87 million dollars. The next page is Fund 21, which is the District Activity Fund, and uh, this includes certain all of the school accounts uh, where they transact, uh, like the, all their library accounts and their picture funds, their um, 
the, all of our athletic programs, those are all a part of that $706,000 you see listed. So at the top part, we show the revenue, and then the expenses are listed there. And then the bottom just, just breaks all of that down by school so that you can see um, what is spent by school, totaling back to that $706,000. We were, if you compare the total district activity fund to last year, it's down quite a bit. But we, if, you know, if you think about the impact that obviously the shutdown had mm -hmm. in the spring, a lot of activities did not occur. And we have a second set of pictures and, and so forth. So that, uh, of course, some of the spring sports did not get started and didn't, uh, didn't produce those gate revenues and so forth. On the next page, this is a fund 310, 320, and 400, which is our capital outlay, our FSPK building fund, and our debt service fund. So this just aggregates those three funds together to give you a look at, uh, you know, we started, we carried over $61,000, and that was actually all in our building fund. And then we, of course, were required according to uh, the SEEK calculation, we're required to provide local portion of our uh, property taxes, that's the 561000 And then the state, through the SEEK formula, gives us that one million four hundred and seventy three three thirty eight, as well as the uh, the SFCC money of two hundred ninety four two hundred five, um, And then the uh, fund transfers, that's uh, that's for a bond payment issue that we, that we have to pay out of the general fund and transfer money into the debt service fund. And um, you can see the debt service amounts listed at the bottom on the expenditure side. And that also includes principal and interest payments. So all that totals about $2.2 million, and we would expect to have about $207,000 left over at the end of the year. In aggregate there again for all those, all three of those funds. The bottom part just shows a listing of all of the bond issues that are currently outstanding from which uh, we will be paying, uh, making payments on throughout this fiscal year. The balance, you know, just like you would expect on, if you looked at a loan, the, the loan or principal balance at the beginning of the year is in that first column, and then our payments will be made up of, of 1.4 million in principal and interest payments of $432,000. And so when we deduct the principal off of those beginning balances, then we'll have about $13.7 million that we would owe at the end of the year. Now the, uh, the district, if you look at those principal and interest payments, the district portion of that $1.8 million, if you add those two together, uh, we're paying, as I had presented to you before earlier on the slide, uh, uh, 1,574,000, and then the state kicks in their portion. It's almost $300,000. Then last is the food service fund, and we've been in a uh, a position with this fund where we've been trying to kind of pay it down because the state says you've got too much money. You have it, you're determined to have an excess balance. So we have been uh, trying to, in, to buy equipment that we need in certain schools, uh, dishwashers and so forth, to uh, try to spend some of that money down. And um, so that's one reason why we're, this is, the balance would be down a little bit, the, uh, which is part of that 985000 down from what it would have been otherwise. But um, anyway, still in, still in really good shape, and, and it will be, a challenge to spend that down. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but we do have a plan in force for that. So we're working on it. <laughs> but that's a good problem to have. Right? <laughs> you don't have any questions? Good job. Thank you all. Thank you. If it's in the cafeteria, you could. Yeah. But if it's not in the cafeteria, you could. Oh, yeah. Okay, get a little for you. <laughs> <laughs> roll it, roll it there for that. Over. Any motion to approve? 
All right, the next uh, seven, six or seven agenda items all pertain to this project. They're all based off, uh, off of what uh, this project requires moving forward. And that's a change from what it used to be as far as the number of items. Used to, it's a little more streamlined, but now KD is requiring multiple steps and multiple contracts that have to be approved, thus so many lines. But the first one here is approving this bid. So if you looked in your packet, you should have seen the bid tab. The bid tab showed. I need to step up just a okay. I make sure this ain't back on more. Go right ahead. The bid tab showed seven contractors showed up. I will say uh, I've been here 13 years and I think that's the most that I've seen in this boardroom mm. for any project. Uh, usually we have three. I think the most I've seen before is maybe four or five, but there were seven different here. That shows that folks are eager for business. And then several even stuck around after we did the bid tab. Uh, obviously Q&S contracting was the lowest at 1.222 million. And you see the highest was a 1.424 million. And then you had the other five there in between those, those marks. But there was multiple companies that hung around to ask more questions of RBS about the ROTC Auxiliary Gym, and then also uh, Render Education Center going to ATC because QNS, who was low bid on this, obviously was very much interested in trying to get those two jobs as well. But so were three or four of these other com companies. They were like, hey, we're going to be aggressively going after those other two projects because they're on the same campus. We can basically go to that one spot and do two projects at once. So I think that when those times come, we'll see some good numbers on, on those projects as well. That was pretty close bidding, though. Yes, all of them were pretty tight. Some of them been like way Yeah, there. several hundred thousand. Yeah. In this case, uh, 200,000. Q&S, they're the one that built the soccer building. Are they? Mm -hmm. Q&S, yeah. I asked about them. I wasn't as familiar with them. RBS said we've done they're projects with them and that they do, they're not as big as some of those other ones, but they do good work. And uh, so you saw the letter, I think, from Kyle Abney that recommended that we go with them, that they've had good success with them. Uh, so it'd be my recommendation to uh, approve and accept these bids for the Wayland Preschool Edition. Uh, what else has q and done besides the soccer building? That's the only thing I think they've done for us. I point blank asked Kyle that question and he told us in here, Kathy, and I don't remember what schools he said, but there was... Did he do, who did there was the, two or three projects that he rattled off that they have worked with them in the school system. Who did the, who I did did the remember. southern part of this? I'd be afraid to take a stab at it, Dwight. I really don't. I know. haven't heard of Q&S. Some of these others I have heard yeah. of, but not Q&S. The hospital just used, just used them. Is that who did those Q&S? Sure, yeah. That's, well, that's what we just approved to do. The expansion? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I hope they got enough people to do it. He, oh he said that they're a good <laughs> company hard. and that they've had a lot of success with them in the past. He said they're good. He said they're not as big as two or three of these other ones yeah. as Alliance or some of these. But but they got they got on that up there soccer and they didn't they didn't like just go up there and start something and then just pull off and it was gone. They was there regular and well, I asked about this project and. Cause you never know how projects go and they always end up seem like sometimes pushing the envelope from the date they say they'll be ready but they act like uh, QNS indicated that we would be able to use that come next school year in August that we would be able to be in that preschool edition. Awesome. That Did they have an idea when it was going to start, going to start after that? I was under the impression that uh, if we approve everything tonight that they may be moving on site and doing some activities during fall break, doing some dirt work on that edge and trying to start getting some things prepped and ready. Oh, that would be great. So, sounds like a lot of people were eager to, eager to work yeah. and uh, they said good things about Q&S, so my recommendation would be to approve these bids, to accept these bids as presented 
Send it this evening. Approving four. 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 Yeah. Right. I'll make the motion. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Okay. Approving the contract with uh, QNS contract. Since QNS was the lowest bid and we just accepted those bids, the next item would be naturally to enter into a contract with them so that they can uh, move forward with this project. I'll make that motion. I'll second. All in favor? Okay. I need to revise the BG-1 for what? Revise the BG-1. I think this may be the third time. If you remember, we did a BG-1 <laughs> on the planning phase, and that's when RBS said we think it'll be 1.25 million. And then if you remember when they come and did the drawings, uh, when Kyle was here, it went to 1.3 million yeah. for the bid because they said due to some dirt work it went up well it ended up coming in as you just accepted the bid at 1.222 million so now we've got to revise the bg1 to reflect the 1.22 million for the contractor price instead of the 1.3 that we estimated last time so that's a uh, actually a good revision this time yeah. it's going in our favor i might be a motion to approve the revised bg1 i'll second all in favor Okay. Yeah. The the next three all are somewhat similar. Used to back in the day, the contractor paid for inspections, and they included that in their bid but they were in control of it. They got their own inspections. They hired the people that did it. Well, that doesn't work the best because they're working for them. So therefore that gets pulled out of the project now and you have the opportunity and we took advantage of that opportunity. There's three of those different areas and we'll look at the first one, special inspections. That is typically what's involved in that one is uh, them doing uh, concrete samples as they're pouring concrete for the footers or floors, whatever, they take cylinder samples and then they test it every, on seven days, 14, and then 28 days. And they test to make sure that the concrete is good and sound before the project keeps moving on. That way if there's an issue, they have them remedy that before doing the, the project. This is using a third party. That way that third party will work for us to do the inspection instead of working for QNS. That way if there is a problem, they're gonna speak up. We're the ones paying them, not QNS. And this does, like I said, their, their main thing they do will be uh, the concrete inspections. All right. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Um, All right. Now we've got to approve the commission for first. The one above it. Test, test, test and balancing. Number eight. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so approve test and balancing. Again, more of the same. This one has to do with the HVAC system. It's someone to come in and make sure that everything's been installed correctly, that the controls work correctly, so forth and so on. It's another third party. We take, there was people here that bid on that. We took the lowest bid. And so that's what you have before you. I don't have the company listed in front of me, but Thermal whoever that. Balance. Thermal balance. Thermal balance was the low Next, bidder for that. Field. So it'd be my recommendation that uh, we approve uh, them to do the testing and balancing for the Wayland project. I'll make a motion. Second. All in favor? Okay. Now. <laughs> yeah, commissioning, more of the same. It's more testing. They, they do exhaust systems, they do the water, the heat pumps, things of that nature. It's something else that commissioning used to not be required, but it is required now with KDE. So we had to get a proposal for that as well. So you see it's Performance Commissioning Agency out of Nicholasville. Uh, they may have been the only one, I think, potentially a bid on that. So it's a requirement that you have to do, so it would be my recommendation that we approve um, the commissioning proposal for the Wayland project. I'll make the motion. I'll second. 
motion and a second. Call and fire. Scared. BG3 for Missouri Gym. All right, this is one of the other projects. There is no change in the finances. What this simply was, when if you open the document, towards the very top, the project phase, we're no longer in design development. We're now in construction documents. So they grade in a new box and you have to resubmit the form showing that you're now doing the construction documents instead of design development. So hopefully we will take bids on that and next board meeting, hopefully we'll be able to have bids to present for this project. Again, KDE and their requirements, they just simply moved the box from design development to construction documents, but we have to approve it so that they know that we can move forward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Motion. I'll make the motion. I'll say All right, yeah, motion. Move, All the the right. <laughs> move the box. I'll move the box. Capital expenditures. Alright, what, what this is, is uh, make sure I think I can explain it. In order to sell bonds for this pro these projects, they want to try to do them together to sell the bonds by grouping some of these projects instead of doing them one at a time. So they're, by doing this expenditure reimbursement, basically what's being asked is that if there's a construction payment that's due before we sell bonds, the general fund would pick that up, but then we would be reimbursed at a later date once they sell the bonds. That's if there's a construction payment to occur before we sell bonds. No guarantee that it will, but it's possible that it could depending mm -hmm. on how fast they start. So with this resolution, by you approving it tonight, it allows us to go ahead and pay for it out of general fund and then be reimbursed for that later on. But it gives us the authority to cover those bills until the bonds are sold. Is that correct? All right. Be my recommendation to approve uh, the capital expenditure reimbursement resolution. All right. We have a motion here. I'll make a motion. I'll second. All in favor? Approve appointment to uh, to Beard and to serve as fiscal aid. All right, that is uh, basically just giving Baird, formerly Hilliard Lines, the authority to sell those bonds on our behalf for these projects. That takes action in order for them to start doing what they need to do on their end. So it'd be my recommendation that we allow Baird uh, to be the one to service those bonds for us since they do all the other for us. All right, I have a motion. I'll second. I have a second. All in favor? Here, number 13, special needs bus purchase. Yeah, I asked you to add number 13 this afternoon. This topic come up uh, in our budget that Miss Meredith reviewed with you this evening even. You know, we, we talked about before ordering three buses. Uh, this year, with this Volkswagen grant that has occurred, if you have buses that are daily route, in daily route, they're being used every day on a route, okay? <laughs> they're being used every day on a route. <laughs> You're getting dug down over here. And if they're a 2001 or older, and you're using them every day, then you can participate in this grant and get half of the cost of a bus back. We have two buses that are 2001 or older that we're using every single day. So we're gonna be able to apply for that grant. And basically what's going to happen is that's right so out of the money that we're going to use to get three buses we're really going to be able to use that same money pretty much and get fourth get a fourth bus well one of those that we need is a special needs bus all but one of our daily use buses in special education has air conditioning so if we get a new special ed bus now every special needs bus would have yeah, air conditioning Talking with the uh, mechanics today, that's really what they would love to see happen. Happen, and I said, okay, we'll talk about buses. Probably the next board meeting to get approval to order four buses. Lo and behold, they, maybe they set me up. I don't know. <laughs> but while I'm out there talking with them, uh, Dave Garbro pulls up, and he's the Thomas salesman, and he's talking, and they're saying, hey. 
we're telling the superintendent here, the boss, that we need a special needs bus. And he said, you know what? I got one next week going to be here that I'm going to use for a demo. But if you want it, it's yours. And uh, I said, well, you know what? I'm having a board meeting tonight. And if they want it. I wonder if they knew that. We'll take it. And uh, he said, all right, I'll wait for you to call us tomorrow. So I said, well, we'll talk about it tonight and uh, see if we can uh, Is that what that determine to do. Was about yeah, I said, I my card says sucker. I may have walked right into that one. I don't know, but we need it nonetheless. So what remind me. What's the price on that? Uh, I didn't look at that. Yeah. Yeah, about 98 or 99. And it'd be a Thomas. Thomas, again, this year is actually, that's what we've been buying. We like that style. And it's actually cheaper than International and Bluebird this year. Thomas is the better priced bus this time. It's got channel windows and everything, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep, and it will have air conditioning. So it'd be my recommendation that we approve the purchase of a, a special needs bus. And uh, we may have it here in just a couple of weeks or so. <laughs> That's just really too much of a coincidence, you know? <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Motion carry. What about the other three windows? Usually I think it's November 1st, I think, is when that window opens that you actually go in to order them. So uh, this being September at the October meeting, we'll get the approval with the other three, and that way we'll have the prices out here and can tell you exactly what they'll cost. All right, we have reason for closed session. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, possible litigation. All right. Any motion going in closed session? First carry is 614810. I'll make it. Yeah. All right. We have a motion. Second. And a second. Okay. All in favor? Motion carries. We are now in closed session.